February 20th, 2014. Dear audience member, dear listener, dear friend, I sincerely thank you for being here tonight and for the opportunity to speak to you here in Toronto as part of the Urban Field Speaker Series. You might find it strange that I, the featured speaker of this event, would choose to address you in a letter format. <laughs> Letters, after all, are mailed, emailed, I guess, nowadays, but they are rarely read in public, uh, especially to that public to which they are addressed. You, you, you. <clears throat> but there are a few reasons for which uh, that compel me to do this. First, because these days I have been engaging in our project where I am writing hundreds of letters to individuals um, with the hopes to attain a more um, personal communication with each one of them. Um, the other reason, more importantly, has to do with pointing out the fact that in formal lectures, the mode of address is essentially misplaced. The speaker generally speaks to a faceless and abstract idea of the public. Back in the 18th century, uh, David Hume uh, sought to prove that there's no such thing as an abstract idea. For instance, the abstract notion of a tree doesn't exist. This tree exists, that tree exists, etc. Uh, in the same way, the abstract notion of an audience does not exist. What exists is you, and you, and you. Specific individuals who are here, and who right now qualify under the term audience members. Yet the typical speaker tends to address a whole group in that monotone, impersonal voice, which always to me suggests that the speaker might actually be afraid of the audience. <laughs> but well, the problem goes beyond that monotone delivery. It is a fact that in the way that it is directed, you, the audience member, don't feel that it's directed at you. You become in your uh, hopefully comfortable seats, um, submerged in that darkness, uh, while the monotone carries on, slowly falling into a blissful sleep. <laughs> this is what we do. This is why we like lecturers, have a nice voice, we have this beautiful delivery, like a radio announcer, and why we can let ourselves be carried away as a voice shows one side after the next of attractive artworks. But the fact of the matter is that when that happens, very little, if anything, will remain in your mind. Ten years from now, if I'm lucky, uh, uh, only a handful of most of you who are sitting here will remember uh, this day. Uh, me as a distant memory of a lecture that once took place in that building, in that gallery, uh, about something, by like someone. Uh, and maybe an even smaller group will remember that, like what I said, or, or that guy who was from whatever I was talking about. Most likely, they will only, you will only remember, maybe, that someone read out there. Um, I have worked with museums for a long time, too many years. I happened to land on the obscure job of the organizer of public programs in museums in the education department, a job that I happily undertook to sustain my artistic practice and which I still gratefully hold today. I have organized and presented uh, hundreds, perhaps thousands of programs in auditoriums like these, arranging the stage for our world figures, large and small, brilliant and maybe not so brilliant, <laughs> um, the invisible person behind the scenes was rarely acknowledged. This is why I'm always grateful to my hosts for uh, the work that they do to put this event together and for you. But I share this information to convey the fact that over the decades, I have been this unusual and silent witness in the corner of what people do and say in the art world, at the podium and behind the scenes. And at times, I've been that frustrated organizer, looking at how a symposium or a panel discussion uh, turns deadly with nothing that I could do to allow. <laughs> that experience has taught me a lot about art, or, or 
perhaps mainly about how we behave around art, um, <clears throat> how this behavior becomes, in a sense, the engine through which we make meaning of art. Art may be a, an individual experience, but it is when we speak about it, when we exchange impressions about it, when it becomes a communal experience, when it acquires a collective meaning. This is, way, uh, this is the way that we speak about art and, it's, and our behavior when we speak about art. This is very important to me. And this is why it is important to think about situations like this when we are talking about it. Back in 1971, uh, Donald Bly published a book titled, What is the Use of Lectures? It's a wonderful study on the actual effects of lecturing. In the book, Bly argues that, we are, uh, that lectures are not an effective learning tool, or, at the very least, not more effective than other means of communication. Um, it has been proved time and again, as John Dewey argued more than 100 years ago, that we learn from experience by doing and not by hearing from others, or less from hearing from others. And yet, lecturing dominates in the academic world in the most forms of public presentation. And why is that? What to do then? What would you do, my friend, my listener, if we didn't have lectures? What would we do then? You might also want to ask me, well, so if you dislike the lecture format so much, why are you here lecturing? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, part of the answer is that I, perhaps, maybe, you might say, in a perverse way, I do love the format of a lecture. But only in as much as if can become an artistic medium. Performance lectures is what you could perhaps term them. This, if you may, is a performance lecture, um, which I promise will be over very soon, <laughs> and will be followed by an athlete component where I will talk about other things in a normal way. <laughs> um, it is that I believe that we need to inhabit certain social rituals, certain cultural rituals of living in order to be able to transform them and question them from within. The lecture is a form, a genre of live speech, in the same way that the sonata is to music. But the second part of the answer is that I'm interested in the idea of the public program per se, of the live event, of this conjunction of time and place. Because that is where I believe true alternativity lies in our making. I won't bother you much with my reasons, but I feel I need to briefly enumerate them. First, what truly dominates our lives today are events more than places. This is true of the art world, where even when it's mainly about exhibition making, what ends up truly mattering is the event when the exhibition opens, the vernissage, the, the first event, the first day. What ends up truly mattering? Second, the proliferation of art and speed of information about everything has made the amount of attention that we give to a topic absolutely crucial. It is much easier to frame that attention through an event than through a place. As an example, museums have no choice but to dynamize themselves through programming to maintain relevance. And third, artists are changing their practice to reflect more closely the social process as an extension of the work. This is a long process that has been going on since the 60s. We call it sometimes socially engaged art or social practice. Sometimes we call it contextual art, relational aesthetics, etc. But the point is that less and less artists conform themselves with existing from within four white walls. They want to define the larger context within which art is presented. And this context changes all the time depending on who is there. So again, the best frame to define that context is not the place itself, but the conjunction of time and place and people. And it can just be a long time, like a month. It has to be an amount of time that is measurable and experienceable within a regular person's schedule, say a couple hours. Thus, the critical importance of the event. So I have taken upon myself to understand what this new conjunction of time and place and people mean. And today, I will talk to you about a few examples. But to start with the obvious, if there is an unassailable notion about art, one that cannot be commodified or domesticated is the idea that the conjunction of time, place, and people is unique and irrepetible. There will never be another moment like this, right now, tonight in Toronto, to Thursday the evening on 20th of February of 2014. That moment belongs to you and me, and to no one else. 
even if you or I were to document this moment and try to sell it, put it in a gallery, collect it, the experience of having lived it could not be transmitted. It is the ultimate blessing of the live event that it can never behold permanently, that it will die. We learn from the lessons of performance art that first emerged with the objective to emphasize the moment, the moment of the definitiveness of the present. And now that museums want to collect, canonize it, there are those who are happy to enable us that process. I don't want to enable that process. The integrity of the experience lies completely in the fact that this cannot be repeated ever again. In the fact that, as I say these words, they already are gone. That you can possibly remember every one of them and will slowly fade into the background until they are some kind of rough memory, a blur, and then nothing. Christian Boltanski, when I was a student and I heard him at a lecture, once said a really memorable thing. <laughs> I still remember it. He said, um, we die twice. First, when our actual death occurs. But the second time, which is the definitive, is when someone finds a picture of us and no one can recognize it. No one knows who that person is. That is the moment of our definitive death. Who said that the only fate of art should be an inanimate object within four walls? Why couldn't it be a rumor, a legend, a myth, a misremembered, anecdote, that which is not written, that which was there but was now, has now disappeared, that which our collective memory has decided to retain, that which we're willing to eliminate so we can keep the version of the remembrance that we prefer and sometimes insert it to others, like the last person to leave the room and turn off the lights. I welcome that moment of final anonymity, and in the meantime, let's celebrate what we have and we experience inside and outside of memory, and inside and outside of art. And now, I shall get off the printed page and proceed to lecture. <laughs> Sincerely yours, Pablo. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming tonight. And I meant everything that I said in that letter, by the way. Um, I do, um, <clears throat> as, as, as Victor very accurately and extensively talked about all my books and my things, I, I think you have a better memory than me about all these things. So I, I really thank you. Uh, I will uh, speak of, about actually none, almost none of those projects <laughs> right now, uh, but with a few exceptions. Um, uh, because I wanted to focus on the subject of what I describe in the letter, the idea of the public program and the event. But I do want to say um, that, indeed, it's very difficult for me in these circumstances to really explain the, the variety of things that I do. If you ever encounter me at a cocktail party and, and uh, somebody asks me, what do you do, I completely freeze and I can never really say anything because it's, it's very difficult to, to explain that I am interested in doing things like this, like objects that are contradictory, uh, I do things that are acoustic guides uh, in exhibitions. Uh, I do one-to-one -one encounters with people in cafes as artworks where I tell them their future. Uh, I, I do transatlantic journeys from Alaska to Chile with a, with a traveling schoolhouse where I meet people and we talk about the future or not future of the Americas. Uh, or I do public art projects. Um, in various plazas and things. I do phonographic recordings of uh, extinct and dying languages, uh, and I do cartoons as well, which usually is the only thing people see uh, <laughs> on the web. Um, the, the, but this, this is all really part of a very long journey that, uh, that started in, uh, in Mexico City, where I'm from, where I grew up and, well, and was born and raised. And, um, and then my arrival, as Victor also mentioned, to Chicago, where uh, I encountered a very complex um, wor art world that I was uh, um, aware of at, at that age. Um, I came uh, to Chicago as an 18-year-old with the idea to, of making public art, thinking that public art maybe literally meant just making murals. Uh, and I, was, I wanted to be a muralist and wanted to move to Paris and such. I couldn't afford to move to Paris, so I moved to Chicago. 
and I and I did not find muralism, but I found uh, Barbara Kruger and and uh, and Andrea Serrano and and uh, and uh, a very uh, contentious moment of the late 80s, uh, the culture wars, that really impacted me. At first, I didn't know what to make of it, but over the years, um, um, I, uh, as, as, I, as, I, as I started doing experiments as, as a, as a, as a in performance and conceptual art, I, I felt that I had found something in, in performance in the, in the idea of the event. Uh, I was very frustrated as a, as a, as a young artist that I couldn't really fit everything into a painting. When I discovered performance, I realized everything could fit into a performance. Anything could be a performance. Um, my first uh, event, let's say, was a, uh, a work that was more than 20 years ago, uh, which was the reconstruction of a photograph where my, my father um, appeared. Uh, and it was very interesting in that photograph. It was a dinner of a Rotary, Rotary Club, which is a famous club in in Chicago, it was really the only family connection that I could find with my new life in Chicago. My father was also living in Chicago, had moved with us to, uh, to Chicago. So I decided to recreate that dinner, uh, inventing a very um, complex uh, and completely fictional story exhibition, uh, arguing that, that this photograph had very t close ties to the gallery where we were doing the exhibition. And we were gonna recreate that moment exactly as we could recall it. So we did this entire dinner <clears throat> uh, that was um, done 50 years um, after this photograph was taken in Xochimilco, Mexico in 1943. Uh, we recreated the same photograph in 1993 in Chicago. My father is sitting at the end of the table in the same spot where he sat in the original picture. Um, the idea is that 50 years from, from 1993, which is, will be in 2043, we will recreate this picture once again to hopefully bring everybody together. I mean, it's been already 20 years. We only have a few more years to go. Um, 30. Yeah. Um, so, um, but what, what, the, the, what the reason why, and you know, I was very young when I was making this piece. I was not really sure what I was doing. Sometimes I still don't know what I'm doing. But um, the, um, the point of the, the piece, I think, what was meaningful to me was that I was trying to historicize a moment uh, in, in my life and, and to give particular importance and relevance to a particular point in time. Um, and uh, this was something that I could not have perhaps articulated at the time, but that uh, in a way has been an ongoing constant in my work. Uh, the, the, the notion that you, as I said in that letter, you know, we, we perhaps the, the best way to, to conduct one's lives is to appreciate every single moment and place where you're in. And, and to, even though we look back at history and we appreciate the moments of history, um, it's, it's the way that we, we look our, at our, ourselves in that point in time as a valuable moment. And what happened with that particular instance is like the moment that, that I told everybody that this was such an important event and we're going to take this photograph and do this ritual, uh, everyone became very excited. So it became kind of like this very, uh, through this very maybe fictional ritual, we had created an important situation. Art had, br had brought us together to create a situation where we would interact with each other. So um, I will just give you a very brief overview um, of how I, 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 my approach for programming or the, the notion of, of program as a conceptual piece. Um, like I said before, I've been a programmer for many years in museums and I've been always interested in doing experimental um, uh, ways of conviviality and exchange. Uh, at some biennial in Puerto Rico, a, a curator invited me to, to do an event that she said, well, we, we could do maybe like a symposium or a panel. And I said, what, what don't we do the symposium, Plato's symposium? Um, uh, and uh, if you have ever read the symposium, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's one, of, one of the most entertaining of Plato's uh, works. It's essentially a big banquet uh, where all the famous philosophers of ancient Greece are ha sitting there, uh, Socrates and and Aristophanes is there and a bunch of others, and uh, they're all getting drunk. And at some point, Agathon, who is the host, says, let's talk about love. <laughs> you know, everybody has to do a speech about love, about what they think love is. Right? So everybody stands up and do, like, their, does their thing, you know, their whole speech about love. And it's, it's a beautiful uh, dialogue. Um, and, uh, and, and it's also a very interesting way in which Plato takes uh, each one's ideas, uh, uh, theories about what love is. And then, of course, Socrates comes at the end to weigh in and then put everybody in their place by like really telling everybody what love is. You know? 
Um, and um, so what we did is we, um, we asked uh, curators, artists, and other people to actually play those roles, but to write their own speeches about love, a love for art. Uh, and, uh, and we spent also all day drinking and eating this banquet um, and uh, in, in Puerto Rico, in San Juan, or in, in Rincón, Puerto Rico, to actually do these speeches about love. So it was, again, another example of like a, a moment where food, time, place co coexist in the recreation of a historical event. But in this case, this is a, a fictional historical event, which is Plato's dialogue. The, um, the, the event, what I'm, so, and what I'm interested about the event, in, 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 the, in the sense that it becomes a celebration, is that, um, that when you create a celebration, there's always a sense of a anomaly, uh, a sense of uh, breaking the, the usual patterns of what's going on in every day. So when, when, we are in the, when it's Halloween, you know, we, all, we all have permission to dress you know, like witches and whatever, wizards and angels or whatever. Um, which would be ridiculous if, if it was not Halloween. If I dress like SpongeBob right now and I go out, it would look like an idiot, right? But if I do it in Halloween, it's permissible. You know, I don't need to do those things because I'm a performance artist anyway, so I can do whatever I want, right? But um, but anyway, so that, that but that's what I mean is it, it's what uh, what Bakhtin calls the carnivalesque. You know, this 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 permissible uh, parenthesis of life where you actually can do very very things. You know, and that's what that's what every holiday is, right? <clears throat> so there was a particular holiday in the Middle Ages called the Feast of the Ass um, that was connected to, to the Christmas holidays, but it was also it had a pagan tradition. The Feast of the Ass was a very interesting celebration, and this is mainly in France, where um, uh, it, was, it, was, it was complete mayhem. It was, it was like a carnival, but it was a carnival where all social roles were reversed. So if you were, you were a man, you will be a woman. If you were a child, you will be an old man. If you were an old man, you were a child. Uh, and if you were rich, you will have to ask, act, act poor. And if you were poor, you act rich. And the donkey was the pope. And, and <laughs> the donkey will be dressed in this pope garment and will be brought into the church with an incredible uh, parade and song and celebration. So uh, I was always fascinated by this idea of the Feast of the Ass and the reversion of roles, specifically in thinking of the museum, you know? Uh, so, something that when, when a director of a museum in Mexico City, and th the great thing about working in Mexico is that you can break, you can do really things that n they will never allow you to do in the, <laughs> in the developed world, <laughs> uh, which is like bringing a, a donkey. If I brought a donkey at MoMA, I would probably be fired the next day. Um, but, you know, at Mexico, that's still possible. So, uh, I propose, well, let's bring a donkey into the museum and do the Feast of the Ass. In the museum, what, what, what the Feast of the Ass really consisted in uh, was a series of seminars and lecture uh, and, and courses uh, where I taught uh, everybody to play a different role. So, we, we taught a course for curatorial issues uh, for the public, so that everyone in the public could become curators. Uh, all the curators will have to learn how to be artists. You know, all the artists have to learn how to be critics. So everybody had to learn to do something that they have never done before. Uh, the, the artists had to write like reviews of shows, and they will understand how difficult it was, in fact, to be a critic. Uh, the public, learning how to curate, started learning about how difficult it is actually to curate and such. So uh, on the on the day of the feast of the ass, where the ass came and, and uh, was hanging around in the galleries, we also did a variety of programs for performances and presentations of curatorial uh, ideas and reviews by different artists. So it was it was a a um, it was a celebratory, celebratory uh, parenthetical event in the life of a museum that was really about looking at each other in in a way in, in a performative way where uh, we will try to become another. <clears throat> and, and you know, to me, that, that is, I guess, a, an ongoing interest of mine of how, in the, in the process of, um, of the, that carnivalesque or that celebration, that you, that you engage in that very meaningful relationship with one another. Um, because of my interest in music and other things, I, I started thinking, combining the two things uh, to see if, on whether it was possible to do an experience that started big and then went into very, very specific. Um, what, um, what, I, what I started doing um, was creating a project that, that was called the, the Combinatory Conference or Combinatory Lecture. Uh, what it consisted in was to work with around 16 people 
um, it could be 32 or 16 people, in this case it was 16 people. Um, I asked each one of them to come up with a three minute lecture on a subject that they felt they were very expert on. It could be a subject about anything. It could be like about how to cook um, tofu, you know, or, or uh, how, to, how to swim, uh, a particular kind of swimming method, or, or uh, Jacques Derrida, if you, if you were a specialist in Derrida. Uh, or the city of Paris where you lived and such. So everybody gave a three minute lecture uh, of that particular subject that they were completely uh, an expert on. Uh, and um, once they did the presentation, they were asked to, let's say, conceptually marry the next person. So the two persons will have to come up together with one lecture about, about of three minutes merging those two topics. So. Um, Derrida and swimming, for example, you know, or tofu and Paris, you know, uh, uh, and uh, somebody had chosen the toilet, you know, and uh, and uh, somebody had chosen um, uh, memory, you know, uh, etc. So toilets and memory, you know. So uh, and then after after that second round. Um, which was uh, eight people, then we'll do a third round, you know, where we'll have to merge those four lectures into one, into, of three minutes as well. So Derrida, swimming, the toilet, and uh, memory, you know? Uh, so what was, was, it was kind of like a kind of a gymnastics of the mind, you know, where you would actually have to negotiate the, the ideas that you had, um, that you were an expert on, with the other ideas that people were bringing together. Uh, and in the end, uh, we were left with one single lecture, uh, uh, basically given by 16 people at this, uh, in, in different moments. It was like a collectively written lecture uh, that they will all present together. So it, it, it was a, um, in a way, it's it's kind of like inspired on 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 alchemy, on hermetism, and on on, on corporate ideas of like a um, brainstorming, you know, and the things like that. But 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 mainly. It, it had as a, pur as a purpose to give people an incentive to be part of a conversation to which you have a uh, an investment on. You know that you that you are part of the you have a stake in that conversation, and that's something that to me has always been very important in in all the work that I do. <clears throat> um, but I also have been interested in the idea of fiction, you know, and the idea in which a um, the moment that you create that ritual, that um, um, that convention, the social convention of like you guys are sitting and I'm speaking and such, there's there's a particular behavior and certain structure of things. That there's many ways and you can circumvent that structure, or that you, I'm sorry that you can they can disrupt the structure and uh, and make it more ambiguous. So I started doing projects where, uh, for example, I, I started doing uh, performances where. Uh, that consisted in four simultaneous panel discussions going on at the same place. Uh, that that the first one will start, and the second one surprisingly will start on, on the, the other side, and then the third one will start. At the, and then uh, apparently they, they were about three completely different things, but then they will start merging, and then they will become about the same thing. You know, so it was like dueling lectures that uh, that in the end did co coincide. And I'm very interested in the in the art of the fugue, in the, the work of Johann Sebastian Bach and. Uh, and the world timber clavier and such. I've been very interested in how um, the the idea of rhetoric, uh, which was really an inspiration for Baroque musicians, uh, can be brought back into a conversation, so that you can actually have a structure of speech where you can you can say one phrase and then the second phrase comes in, and then, and then a, of a second person and the third phrase comes in. And then they start intertwining. The first person says the third phrase, and the second person says the the, sec the, the one first phrase, etc. Um, it has also taken some political dimension, and uh, and perhaps one of the most riskiest ones uh, is something that I did around ten years ago in Mexico City, where um, I was very uh, me and other friends were very uh, incensed that. Uh, the, the, the city government had become very conservative and was engaging very conservative politicians as advisors, including Rudolf Giuliani, which for us was like really like the last throw of that. Um, I, I remember asking the curator, a curator in Mexico City, that whether he would support me in doing a guerrilla activity uh, piece, uh, and he he agreed. Um, and what we did uh, was to 
um, launch a Congress of uh, Cultural Urban Purification of Mexico City. Uh, it was the first International Congress of uh, Cultural Urban Purification of Mexico City. Um, we're sending a call for papers where uh, we, uh, we basically said Mexico City is very polluted, um, but it's also very polluted culturally. How would you purify it? Um, it was, of course, a very facetious, a very uh, fascist thing to say. But I don't know if you have noticed that if you say something in public loud enough and formally enough, you can be outrageous, but people will actually will listen to you. you know? um, and um, so people did, and the people started sending papers to participate in this conference. Uh, we received a lot of papers uh, as far as from Colombia to participate in this forum. Uh, so I selected six papers, uh, suggestions for how to purify uh, culture. Uh, so I wrote, I decided to, to accept those papers and invite the actual speakers to read the papers, but I also wrote six more papers uh, and I hired actors to learn them. Um, so these, these papers would actually, these, these actors would we inhabit or become specialists of different uh, positions. They were anarchists, they were right wing, they were super left wing. Um, there were socialists, there were Marxists, etc. Um, we also uh, rented a neutral place to do this activity. It will have not worked to do it in a museum or art space. We basically went to a convention center in a hotel downtown Mexico City, and the big day came with registration and badges and everything that you can possibly imagine. Uh, because I've done this a million times too, so I, I know how to do a conference. Um, and so. Um, and because people know me as also organizing events like this, they, they didn't really suspect that everything was, um, well, not everything, but uh, there, was, there were some, some things that were uh, tweaked in the <laughs> presentations. Uh, the first presentation was really, was about uh, culture in the city. Uh, we had the, a traditional uh, presenter who, who was uh, trying to um, promote classical culture in, in the city. So we had somebody who was anti-contemporary art, who was saying like, why, why should even uh, support contemporary art? Uh, and, uh, and we had a classicist who was really um, attacking um, every kind of artists. Uh, we had a populist who was attacking the classicists. And, and uh, basically everything, everyone was attacking each other, you know, uh, in that first panel. It was kind of confusing. Immediately the, the people were, uh, the, the public was immediately reacting to this thing and, and really engaging in, in dialogue, like believing, couldn't believe that things were being said out loud, finally, in a, in a public forum. The second uh, panel, uh, I invited a, an Austrian friend to read a, a, a paper. Uh, this Austrian friend of mine from New York flew, so nobody knew who she was. Uh, she read a paper that ostensibly she had written about uh, education in Mexico, arguing that Mexico had not had an uh, education policy since 1920, uh, with such specific references that people were completely in awe that she, had, that she knew them. You know? Uh, the guy at the far right was another high school friend of mine who was an actor who uh, acted as a, uh, a city politician from the right party uh, pre. So he started attacking her, saying that how can she like, say these things about Mexico? The entire audience went against him, saying you as a politician who has done nothing for the country, you know, how can you attack her? You know? uh, the, the real presenters were on the left, and you can see how worried they look you know, about, about the entire uh, discussion taking place. They were even smoking, you know? Um, and um, so things were already kind of on the verge at that moment. But I think things came to a, to a head when uh, we had the last, uh, and the last panel where uh, one of the actor, actors, uh, presenters, uh, was an anarchist. He said, like, let's just eliminate every single ministry of culture and every single organization because they're useless anyway, and just, let's just give money to the artists. You know? like, that will be millions of, of dollars that will just go directly to the artists. Like, you know, let's please eliminate all these useless organizations. Um, and the, 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 the last presenter, who was Ryan Hill, uh, another performance artist from New York, who presented himself as a supporter of Rudolf Giuliani, who presented a very detailed program to have the U.S. State Department basically administer Mexican culture. <laughs> um, I don't know if you are familiar with Mexican culture, but basically to say that in Mexico, is, it's, it's uh, one of the most painful things you can possibly hear, right? Uh, yeah, so anyway, um, people were crying at the end of the event. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, somebody saying like, I can't believe we have come to this, this discussion that we are now thinking about like turning everything over to the U.S. to basically run our government. Um, um, so the next day it was it was it was a madness in the press where the, the real presenters were talking to the press and like I can't believe we, I just came from this panel this discussion where we were, these outrageous things are being said. Uh, and then finally we had a discussion in the press about pol cultural politics in the city.
which was the intention of this of this project. And something that happened was uh, eventually, as it was predictable, a critic confronted me in the press saying, you know, was this a performance? You know, um, and uh, who, who was a performer and was this real or not? And and then my question back to them is like, why do you need to know whether that's something that was said by someone um, was a performance or not? You know, what, how does it really change the fact that somebody said what they said? You know, if, does, it, does it really matter that uh, someone from La, from La Sorbonne said the U.S. should administer Mexican culture or, was that, or that an actor said it, you know? What was, what was going on is that, um, and this is going on, this has been an ongoing issue with, in the work that I do, is that people want to know where the frame is, where the, where the border of reality lies. If I tell you, oh, this was just a performance, it gives you me automatically the possibility to dismiss it as something that is not uh, perhaps relevant to your everyday life. You know, it, it's art creates itself those frameworks to exclude itself from relevance. And I think it's very important sometimes for artists to recognize that and to, to resist that drawing of frames. Uh, it is definitely necessary at times and it's important, but I think it's also important to make the point that art is life, that a life is inextricable from, from art. And, and in, at those moments where we cannot uh, say, um, uh, if we want to preserve the integrity of the idea and the work, that this is just an artwork. Because it is not just an artwork. You know, it's, it, it, it's a completely misunderstanding of what art making is about. It's not that I'm just making art. You know, that, ask that to any artist. You say, like, are you just an artist? You know, are you, like, are you just like making art? You know, or, no, or I mean, then or then I just make art, and then I'm not an artist anymore. You know, then I can be someone else. Like you can never stop being an artist. You'll always be an artist the moment you die. So, if that is the case, if you can never really ex stop being an artist, then why should art stop being art, or you should stop thinking about art after a particular moment? So, that was the point. Um, the um, another example, and I'll just give you a few more examples. Um, the Jubilee Players was another attempt at, uh, this time really looking at something that I've always been interested in, which is the art society itself. Um, and uh, uh, Victor references the Manual of Contemporary Art Style and such. Um, <clears throat> I'm very interested in how people, how we value and create value for art through conversation. Uh, when I was invited by a, an organization in Casa City called Grand Arts to do a project with them, uh, what I proposed was that we created a fictional artist um, uh, with an entire retrospective, but that we really give them life. So what we did is we, we invented a, 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 an artist called Juvenile Merst. This is a piece of his uh, called October. It's like an October magazine with a lot of hot air coming out of it. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a... Um, he, he was an artist who hated everything and everyone. He was a like contrarian. So he was, uh, this, this is a piece against feminism, you know. Uh, this is a pornographic piece that he made. Um, and the, anyway, it was a very professionally installed exhibition with, with a catalog and, and, uh, and essays and, uh, and labels and didactics and things like that, which, you know, I do this all the time. Um, and, um, but what was really the most important part of oh, this is a porn film. Um, the most important part of it was that we inserted four, four people into Kansas City life that were connected to Juvenile's life. Um, the ex-girlfriend, the ex-boyfriend, the um, a collector who collected most of Mercer's work, uh, an art historian named Sonia Stillman who had written all of his, about his work, and a very uh, kind of slimy, strange fellow who was a, the moderator of the evening, uh, uh, who was... Uh, Someone who had come aware, become aware of Juvenal's work later. He, he, he was like a, a, a fallen from grace academic who was now a, a consultant, a successful art consultant. Um, anyway, so they, 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 they were at the opening and they met a lot of the people in the Kansas City art community. And the following day, there was a symposium where they all came to talk about Juvenal Mercer's work. Uh, up to that moment, no one had a slightly suspicion that something was off. Uh, in the in the particular exhibition or symposium, um, and then the symposium starts, and um, people start arguing amongst each other about Juvenal's work. While somebody says he was a minimalist, the other one says like, "Are you kidding? He was a Marxist, political, very radical artist." Um, 
and they, they basically there was like a big argument that that uh, it, it devolves into what it really is, which is kind of like a Tennessee Williams type of play, very dramatic. Um, and I'm going to play you just like a, a five minutes of uh, the juvenile prayers and a moment where Sonia Stillman is attacking uh, the the moderator, and uh, and it becomes uh, in the end where like when all when all are all. Whenever, when all hell breaks loose, everybody shows their true colors and their true frustrations with their own career and their artwork. What the artist said, look at the works. Where is the politics in these works? Which brings me to your, your blog, Clifford. Uh, since now that we are telling each other what we really think about everything, I don't even know where to begin. Clifford, your book is so full of inaccuracies that I'm just surprised you had the nerve to publish oh, it. Oh, and now we're going to get a whole Stalinist. No, I'm, I'm serious. It is unbelievable. First, you discuss the work as if he would be some modernist like Mondrian, and, and if, if he would have never done anything political. Again, we go and, back and, to the and same then thing. And then you act as if you would be the sole discoverer of his work. You don't even mention me once in the book. Well, I am sorry, but the chapter is about juvenile and not about you. No, it's not about me. It's about professional honesty. You reference the people who has done the work. You don't just take credit for everything which is not yours. If there is something that really annoys me about people is that not being honest. OK, I have something I have to say to you both. You cannot possess work intellectually. There are no social issues in a piece just because you see them there. God, there's this illusion among curators that everything has to be uh, political or abstract or whatever. It... You, you act as if all we do is just to invent theories out of thin air. The history is real. The art in response to that history is real. The thing with you is that you were perhaps too young to see it, but I can speak of it firsthand because I lived through the social movement of the 1960s. Oh, what the 1960s I saw this? what the movement was about, and it was about deep rooted issues of class and democracy and the freedom of expression, all of which had an enormous impact on the art produced during and after those events. The problem with you is that you, you uh, defend a kind of art that caters to a more market-friendly, commonplace entertainment. Very well then, Sonia. You speak about personal experience, about how the student movements were transformative to you. Yet, you have taken a tenured position at a university that caters to the most affluent. How do you reconcile the spirit of, the, of that with the radical democratization that you defend? You are making comparison between two things that has nothing to do with each other. I think it is completely related because you were the one who brought up personal experience. For it is a matter of professional honesty. Entire career, I have been committed to these ideas. Read my writings. Look at my exhibition essays for the past 25 years. I'm not saying that I am perfect, but I have always seen myself as somebody whose role is to raise consciousness about social and political issues. What sort of consciousness Curators do are you not think evangelists. that you have brought we are not in the business to convert writings? People. But you speak about professional honesty as a sort of religious virtue. But a person who is honest about the wrong thing, it doesn't make it right. This is why no one could support you at the university, Clifford. I don't define what art is. I show it as it is. No, I, I won't even bring up your association with commercial galleries, which I see as a huge conflict of interest as a curator. What good is professional honesty if your commitment has been to treat art as an unthreatening and uncritical product, as a happy and pleasurable and, and entertaining thing to the market? Why should I apologize if the artists that I work with are successful? That's ludicrous. You, in contrast, treat artists as game pieces in a, of a bogus curatorial hypothesis that try to be a soothing balm to our social problems. Not only does it not work as an exhibitory premises, it's bad art. It is bad art like you, who just do not wish to think of the world at large. It's bad art for everyone outside of your circle of friends and Bard. I'm sorry, I'm just, excuse me, just 
can't oh. do this. Uh, what are you doing? No, I'm, I'm sorry. This is, it has become a joke. This is not a discussion. This is just a stupid performance. I'm sorry. I got it. Sorry. Thanks. Clifford, I thought you were supposed to be moderating. I mean, you know how she gets when you bring up politics. I know what I'm doing. I know. I really do. Okay, so that was the juvenile players. Um, so what happens next after this kind of meltdown of Sonia Stillman um, is a big confession by her about how she wanted art to be to change people's lives and, and kind of her, in a way, her um, um, disappointment that she always wanted art to do something that she was never able to, to see it happen, truly. Um, so what we start learning from all these uh, confessions from all these different people when they calm down is that they are kind of uh, out of place, you know, uh, out of place with art in their relationship with art. Um, and uh, people who had lost their age, but who, you know, we still never know whether Joel Lemers was a good artist or a bad artist, but he certainly ruined everybody's lives around him. Uh, and, um, and he becomes kind of like this myth that they had promoted for no real, uh, or they're not really re sure why they had conspired to do that. Uh, all the actors at some point leave the stage uh, and then a finally a very theatrical spotlight falls into Miranda who is the young woman uh, at the end of the table uh, where we unveil definitely the, that this is a play in the end uh, and then Miranda delivers a very uh, emotional monologue about why she left art making you know and why art is something that can hurt you and and that is something that is very difficult to, the, the, the way that art hurts you is something very difficult to take um, <clears throat> So I, I brought the juvenile players uh, at a kind of a moment in time um, where I, I, I guess, you know, we, we all were having discussions about, you know, what is really art for? I think it's a cyclical discussion uh, when we encounter very, this happened in 2001, it happened again, you know, years later. Uh, we really ask ourselves, why make art? Why, why, why make art in a world with so many problems? This is really what the world needs. And, and there are difficult discussions that are not easy to, to answer. You know, um, I will just conclude with a couple of current projects uh, so that um, I'll just bring you at least to the present. Um, Victor uh, mentioned uh, this project that is ongoing right now called Libreria Donceles. It's, it's um, a, a, a project I'm currently engaged with. Um, um, I am in, the, in New York City and uh, New York City has uh, 8 million inhabitants uh, out of which 2 million are Latino and Spanish speakers. And there's not a single Spanish bookstore in New York. Uh, it is part of a phenomenon that there's a combination of the, the rise of the ebook, it's a combination of the fact that the used bookstore is already a lost cause in New York City, but there's only a handful of them left, and the fact that, that people are not buying books anymore. Uh, the fact that we, we're contemplating a, a, a very near future where there will be no newspapers printed and such. Um, but this has a particular effect on the Spanish-speaking population in New York, which is uh, mostly immigrant, and they don't really own e-readers. Uh, and also, they, um, and also the e-publishing the e industry in Spanish is very much behind the, the, the English-speaking uh, uh, industry. And, uh, and the other thing is that there's so many things that are not really published uh, or republished from the Spanish language. In Mexico City, uh, in downtown, there's a street called Donceles. Uh, that is, uh, if you go to downtown Mexico City, um, it, it's an incredible, uh, a densely uh, packed uh, urban area where every street has kind of a, 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 a let's say, a, a business. You know, if you want to buy electronics, you go to República del Salvador. If you go to, if you want to buy like uh, wedding things, then you go to this other place, you know, Calle de Lima. If you, if you if you go to Moneda, then there's printers and, and invitations, and Santo Domingo, like they, they make these like, very business cards. And anyway, so Donceles is the used bookstore street, and it's full of places like this. It's an unbelievable amount of books, and there are incredible uh, objects that are really worth practically nothing. Um, in, in New York, there was a, a, a precedent to this uh, idea of, the, of a bookstore in Spanish. Jose Juan Tablada, who was a very important poet and maybe the first art critic in Mexican history, or modern history, I guess, um, uh, was, in Mexico, was in New York in 1921 uh, as a diplomat, and he had this uh, crazy idea of opening a, a bookstore of Latino literature. Uh, he was a great poet, but a terrible businessman. Um, so it didn't really last. 
But but it was a really wonderful idealistic and utopian spirit that I thought it would be wonderful to follow, and I thought it would be great to fail in the same way that he failed. You know? <laughs> um, so um, I went to Mexico City, and then I um, <clears throat> I started offering my own working exchange of used books. Uh, I know that in Mexico City, everybody has tons of books, uh, um, and um, and and then it started very small. You know, it, it was very frustrating at first, not being getting enough books. Finally, I was able to get a story on the press to, to uh, talk about the campaign, and then then it was the opposite. Then it, then it, then I had a, 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 a an avalanche of books uh, of people coming of every walk of life, uh, retired teachers, uh, lawyers, doctors, uh, children, um, people with really uh, emotional and touching stories. You know, my mom passed away, and this was her her, her library, and and uh, I would love to actually have uh, the, the, her books. Will have she will have loved to have them. Uh, come to your project and such. Um, and it was kind of a very ironic thing that a third world country was sending aid to the most powerful city in the world, you know, that was incapable to teach itself Spanish. You know? um, so what happened was, you know, we were just deluged with books. And then we had the second problem, which was how do you bring all these books to New York? Uh, and uh, so we had to fundraise to bring all the books to, uh, to New York, a, a second campaign. But Donceles did open in September in 2013. Uh, and um, it took over an art gallery, which was kind of an, an interesting and perverse thing, where you will be in the center of the other gallery district, we had a used bookstore without the smell of the old books, uh, with, with uh, uh, 25,000 volumes. Um, and you know, a bookstore, the reason why I'm interested in a bookstore is, is not because it's just a business, it's because it's a, what I would, you would term a third place, a place where people can interact, where, where people in a hurried way, you can have access to browsing and, and, and experiencing books. Um, I created very, and, and each used bookstore, and I know this is true of Canada too, they, they, they have their very idiosyncratic nature. You know, they, it's, it, they resemble their owners. So I, I let it resemble myself in my own more eccentric way. So I, I created my own categories. I put a category of terrible books that I hate. I put them there. Uh, I, I created a category of like cheesy literature, uh, I, 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 like a, of, uh, of a books of youth. You know, like a, there was a youth book uh, section, and then more series like art, movie, music. We had like sixty different categories: sciences, biology, law, um, um, uh, geography, uh, biography, uh, anything you could possibly imagine. We even had a Shirley MacLaine uh, section because for some, some reason somebody gave us like a lot of biographies of Shirley MacLaine, so we just put it there. <laughs> you know, um, uh, everybody has apparently read The Alchemist, so we had like a whole section of The Alchemist there. <laughs> And we had a section called Marxismo Trasnochado, which means like uh, outdated Marxism, um, <laughs> uh, which is like a very, uh, for some reason in Latin America, well, not for some reason, but for, a, for a very good reason in Latin America, uh, in the 70s, uh, there were like thousands and thousands of, of uh, editions of Marxism and everything you poss possibly imagine, like Marxism and history, Marxism and psychoanalysis, Marxism and your baby, Marxism and, 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 and Marxism and mole, you know, etc. So <clears throat> anyway, but so, so, but, but Don Celes became then uh, a wonderful social conviviality place um, where we invited poets, uh, we invited writers, we invited performers, and we did what we call tertulias in, in the Spanish language, this very, uh, um, I, I love the idea of tertulia, uh, because especially in the in this context of what we're talking about, the public program, the tertulia is a very kind of a specific, it's, it's a soiree, you know. It's a, it's a social gathering that doesn't really have an agenda, very very strictly say, uh, where you more or less, something might happen or might not happen. There might be music, there might be reading, there might be food, there might be drinking. Well, there's always drinking, perhaps. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but, but there's a sense of, of, uh, um, of openness, and that, that, that is not strictly for one person in particular, that many people can join. And, and that was what I was really trying to do with Onceles, you know. Uh, the project continues in um, traveling, and it will open now in Phoenix, Arizona in, the, in a month. And uh, it's a very important place right now uh, uh, for us to do this project because, um, uh, I don't know if you're aware of uh, American immigration uh, debates, but Arizona is the epicenter of, that, of, that, of, that, of those debates. And in places like, like Tucson, which is right next door, uh, they forbid uh, ethnic studies. Believe it or not, like the, the state government defunded uh, all the ethnic studies programs because they felt they were anti-American. So for example, Paulo Freire's uh, 
uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, one of the most important books uh, of, of the most important book of predicate pedagogy, it was was forbidden. It's forbidden in Arizona. You cannot read it. You know, uh, you cannot read the Tempest by Shakespeare because that's also what well, that was. That was one in the list of those ethnic studies uh, curriculum. So so et, so Shakespeare is also. Uh, you know, forbidden, by the way. So if you go to Arizona, don't bring Shakespeare or anything like that. <laughs> you, might, you might land in jail. Um, so anyway, so that's the level of, uh, uh, of, of, of the state of, of, of things that we're dealing with right now in Arizona. Um, I, I want, I, we, we have gone over time, so I will just uh, conclude with this one project that uh, um, kind of ties in with the first project that I, that I talked about. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, this is going to be the last work uh, of my career. Uh, it's called Vita Bel Regula. And um, it started last uh, year, uh, exactly, almost exactly a year ago. Uh, what it consists of is um, it's a game for 50 people, 50 participants. Um, it can only be played once, and it will be played through the course of our entire lifetimes. I invited 25 people who are very close to me, friends, family, people who I know I will continue uh, a relationship with for the rest of my life, all of which are much younger than me and likely to survive me. The other 25 were uh, uh, visitors at a gallery in Milan where we, did, where we launched the project. It was happenstance. It was the place where I did it because it was the place. And uh, they were invited to be part of this life experience and they signed up to do it. Each person got 16 envelopes. <clears throat> Each envelope has a date inscribed in it, and, and it's meant to be open on the date where it's inscribed. So the first one was in March 1st, 2013. The second envelope was supposed to be open two days later, or was open two days later, September 3rd. The third envelope was open uh, tw uh, twice the amount of time of the first one, or the previous one. So it was two days, four days, uh, eight, uh, 16, 32, 64, etc. So as, as the time goes by, you have to wait twice the amount of time to open the next envelope. Um, so, and as you go further, then weeks become months, the, the space between envelopes becomes weeks, months, years, decades. Um, perhaps the last, uh, if I am lucky, the last envelope that I will be able to be alive for will be on January 16th of 2053. <clears throat> uh, but uh, it's very unlikely that I think any of us here will be alive on uh, Thanksgiving Day uh, of November 23rd, 2097. Uh, which is when the last envelope is supposed to be opened. My, my daughter, however, who is part of the game, who is now four, she will be 88 years old on that day. Um, and there's an envelope at the very, that is actually supposed to be opened on the event of my own passing, or the, the, the very certain event of my own passing. You know? uh, the reason why I did this project was because I wanted to do a, a piece that was, that was communal, let's say an ongoing event. Uh, I wanted to make a piece that, that would not simply die when you hang on the, on the walls of a museum, but that continues evolving. And, and, the, and the things that you continue open, open on the particular day, uh, it tells you new things uh, about the piece and about yourself. So it's, it's, it's a correspondence project. It's a one-to-one -one project. It's a very kind of personal and collective thing, but it's also a very public thing. And it's definitely a reflection on, on, on how we evolve over time and over memory. And, and how um, maybe art can really create those bonds that, that are social, that are cultural, and that give meaning to our lives in some capacity. And with that, I will stop and we'll end this portion. Thank you.